Um, thanks very much for uh, inviting me here and, and the opportunity to share a few things. Uh, we talk a lot about big data and we don't talk a lot about no data. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, about no data and what we might do in terms of using the computational strategies that you guys have in mind um, for situations where we currently don't have any data and how we might design uh, ways to solve these problems which have, have, have uh, pestered us for a long time. In particular, let's see if I can figure out which way it is. Um, why, I want to talk about weather data in Africa. Why Africa? Um, well, uh, what we have here is a very, very large continent. And so here's the United States, here's China, here's India, here's Western Europe, there's the UK. Um, basically, you can fit um, much of the rest of the world inside Africa. Not only that, if you look at China, for example, the dark blue is approximately where you get over a meter of rain a year which is typically what the transpiration demand for a, a crop is. And that meter a year is that entire region here in Africa. And so the meter a year area of China is slightly larger than Madagascar. Okay, so to give you a sense for the opportunity that's essentially unrealized in Africa right now, um, we just have to think about uh, feeding the rest of the world in mind of the fact that the average glass of water in China, in, in, in Beijing now is 30,000 years old. So there's a tremendous overdraft of groundwater and we are actually going to need, that's why they can grow so much food with so little water, because there's overdraft. So we have to deal with this. Now, um, if you want to talk about uh, any aspect of utilizing natural resources, such as water for irrigation, um, or disease propagation, if you're interested in Zika or anything else, you might want to have the environmental variables that are, that are controlling those parameters. And uh, so typically you'd have a weather station. And if you look at the United States, our weather stations report 90 to 100% of the time for the most part. South America and Central America, horrible, um, you know, 45 to 90% of the time. Um, Africa is miserable. There are approximately 20 blue dots in the central part of the uh, Sub-Saharan region. Okay, so a terrible uh, lack of information. Now, you might say, well, let's just use satellites, and, and satellites are all fine and well. Um, <clears throat> here is the satellite estimate, daily estimate of rainfall, and this is the very satellite product which they are using now to compensate farmers for crop loss on a daily uh, rainfall basis. And here's the actual 72 stations in the field in Kenya, uh, and this is what they report for their daily rainfall. The, uh, you know, the R squared is about 0.04. I'm not sure how many of you want to balance your checkbook with uh, information of that quality. Uh, the slope is off by a factor of five. Okay, so you have, uh, in other words, all the claims about satellite data for daily precipitation are, 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 are um, highly overstated. Uh, now, why is it that the insurance company doesn't care? Because they don't. Well, because all they want is a dice that they can predict. So they have a lot of satellite data, and they know exactly how, to, how it's going to roll out. And so they can calculate their tables of payouts and have the right uh, cost for the insurance. But if you pay the wrong farmers over and over and over, obviously at some point um, you're, you're going to get a, a, a lack of participation. And so bad data will have its cost. This is currently what uh, uh, compensation is based on uh, for many African uh, farmers. Is there an opportunity to do better than we are currently doing? Or could Africans do better? And I, 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 this is just a little bit of an indication of where Africa is at. And you saw the rainfall they're getting. It's not an overpopulated continent, actually. There's, the population density is, is low by comparison to many other places. So if we look at the blue, those guys are African countries. That's all those guys. This is their income on the order of $1,000 per capita, and this is their harvest in terms of kilograms per hectare, um, a mean of about 1,000 kilograms per hectare. Whereas in the United States, we're right at around 7,000 kilograms per hectare. So uh, why is it that the, that the productivity is so low? These are for cultivated hectares. This is not looking at hectares that are uncultivated. And it's a number of things, obviously. But basically, if you don't have any information about what to plant, then you're gonna, and you, you just use traditional planting uh, strategies, you're going to get lower productivity. If you are not confident that there's going to be rain, and you're planting at the right time, you're going to put in fewer inputs and fewer seeds. Et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of you know, market availability, et cetera. These things all add up. But one thing that's clear is that if we knew where there was the, um, the right climatic conditions for excellent productivity, 
there are people around the world who would help a lot of African farmers uh, get that productivity for financial reasons. And so there's a lot of opportunity to do better than this, but right now we really don't know what the, what the current state of affairs is. And this is compounded dramatically by the fact it's a large continent, and with climate change we know that the changes are going to be most dramatic centrally in a continent. And so not only do we not know the current conditions, we have no idea where it's going. And so would you make an investment under those conditions? No. So we need to solve that problem. Um, to do so, uh, Tom Dietrich, uh, Nick Van de Giesen, who I showed in the first slide, and several of us uh, came up with this Tomo project. I don't know how many of you who are Cornelians know Tomo Steinhus. Um, anybody? Uh, it's Tomo Steinhus uh, is a professor who worked, uh, a hydrologist who worked in uh, Ethiopia developing hydrologic sciences there, and uh, for years and years and years done a wonderful job, and so kind of in honor of him we uh, use this title. But it's a Trans-African Hydrometeorological Observatory. And basically, it came out of the first photograph I showed you with Nick sitting in Ghana, and I, we're doing an experiment weighing trees, actually, as it turns out. We want to know the weight of the trees as relative to the, to the precipitation for uh, hydrologic reasons, and I, we needed precipitation data. There was none. But everyone had a cell phone. And so I was like, well, Nick, we got to, you know, everyone has cell phones. Sensors are cheap. Let's solve this problem. And so we came up with the Tomo project. The idea is we'd like to have instruments with approximately 30 kilometer spacing. This was our first naive idea. This slide is several years old, and I want you guys to fix this slide. What's the problem with this? Well, the deal is that the insurance companies would only call a weather station valid if it was within 30 kilometers of their crop. And so we wanted to have weather stations well within 30 kilometers. That was our, and so on that basis, we need 20,000 weather stations. 20,000 sounds like a lot. But actually, the cost of installing 20,000 weather stations in Africa is of the order of $50 million. $50 million may sound like a lot, but the benefit for having weather data estimated in the United States is $30 billion a year. And in Africa, I think it'd be substantially more than that because the value of land. The value of land right now is orders of magnitude below where it should be because no one knows what they can plant anywhere. But anyway, um, so it, the 20,000 is a reasonable cost, but we could do way better. And if we can lower the price, we could, do, we could have a, a much faster and more, um, a more timely solution to this, obviously. So uh, what we do, though, just briefly, is we do education. So we have sister-to-sister -sister relationships between US, European, and African schools. And the kids are watching their weather, and they're trading data, and they trade letters and stuff. It's really cool. And what that does is the US and European schools help fund the African schools. Um, and it also creates uh, cross-cultural uh, uh, sharing. We have workshops. And what we do is we just um, uh, have people apply from across Africa to do cool technological solutions for environmental sensing. And then we get them together in a room and we have uh, these kind of maker fests. And, um, and this, is all, this has been very, very uh, powerful for the participants. It's also been extremely helpful for us for identifying talent. Um, so when we go back and, have to, and need to, some people to help us on the ground, these are typically fantastic uh, engineers. Um, and then we make our data freely available to all governments and research uh, people. So if you need any data for African weather, let me know. And we will provide you some of the, the uh, most exceptional data uh, uh, that has existed. Um, so the, a little bit about our, our weather station. Um, this is the, the mock-up of it. It's solar powered. The solar panel is this big. Uh, it has a six month reserve battery. It uses uh, cell phone communication, has a GPS compass. Three ways to measure temperature, it measures relative humidity, has a sonic anemometer, so it has no moving, one of the principles is there's no moving parts. Uh, it uses drip counting, so we actually form a drip off the bottom of the rain gauge and count it between two gold, gold electrodes instead of having moving parts there. We have a shortwave solar, we have barometric, we also look at lightning because uh, large storms cause a lot of damage, and so it's important to track those. Um, and we have a bunch of SDI ports. Here is the current, uh, here's some observations. This is the best international prediction. And you can see temperature was off by about 10 degrees for a typical African station. This is kind of the extrapolate from Cairo effect, I call it. Um, we have stations around on cool maps, so you can go click and, and get the data. Um, so is there much, uh, in this room I should think we you have a good answer for me, is there much gain for being smart? This is what I need your help with. This is a new project, so we actually have lots of opportunity. 
Um, just one week ago, um, within two weeks of applying for the funding, we got funding to install 333 new stations. So we all of a sudden got a huge dollop of, of opportunity. And we have to ask ourselves, where the hell do we put these things? Because we have to go into countries we've never worked in before. And we have to identify the ideal locations. How much of a reduction in variance in, uh, in, in between truth and, uh, and, and predicted is possible by employing some sort of pre-modeling to optimize station placement? We have great numerical models. And can we play games where we can uh, you know, jackknife in and out uh, uh, sensors and identify the reduction in variance in the overall signal? Um, and so, uh, and this is in, a key point is we're doing this in absence of, of preliminary information. If you look at the northwest of the United States, we have like a, um, more than 100 inches of rain here and about five inches of rain there. And there was a paper that recently came out on optimal design of climatological networks, which claims that for this region, they can reduce the variance um, by 90% by putting in five to 10 stations. Okay, so our, they can actually get a good representation of the climate of the Pacific Northwest with five or ten stations, they claim. This was in using antecedent data from stations to be able to identify where to put them. We don't have that, but we have really good numerical models. So, ways forward. Um, can we use the methods of Mogger et al., which I've just shown you? What about dithering a, a weather model to find all points which create the greatest ripple, for example? Well, but this may tend to favor upwind sites where there's a lot of, of fetch downwind uh, from those data points. Um, can we simply study really, really well documented continents like the United States where Weather Underground has 200,000 stations and then understand orographic effects, the effects of geography and topography on, um, for making generic rules of, of placement? So, the key point here is we, the, the projects, the, this project is going to change the way uh, climate is observed, first in Africa and then around the world. We're also going into South America and Central America. Um, if we're smart, I think we can spend about 10% as much as we had originally anticipated and get excellent data. Um, we need help on uh, to determination of, is a sensor working? If you, if you find your optimal locations, that means they're largely independent, and that means you have very little information about whether they're, they're working or not. Um, what's the value, of, therefore, of sensor redundancy? Um, and where, um, where should you place them? Um, not only with respect to optimal um, accuracy um, in terms of a geographic sense, but also social and economic benefits. So, uh, thanks very much uh, for the time. Solutions that you've, I've heard in this conference for sensing weather are based on instruments, either satellites or sensors in the field. And I was wondering if there's any uh, consideration of using like just people's observations. Maybe you could gamify reporting weather, or you could buy observations from people on the ground who can, like you know, report via SMS weather observations and what sort of accuracy do you think such a thing. Okay, um, so the question is, can we use gamified uh, observations based on people? And, and Weather Underground has, has gamified it and has 200,000 people uh, sending in their observations in a different sort of context. In Africa, they have about three or four uh, you know, participants. Uh, it turns out cell phones are really great for estimating temperature, so we can actually, even though it's in your pocket, we can get extremely good temperature. Rainfall is much tougher. People tend to go back indoors when it's raining. I'm not sure how we can gamify rainfall. And it turns out rainfall is a very, very important parameter. Um, and other parameters for humidity and things like that. You, there's a general need to have calibrated values. It's not OK to have uh, just kind of I guess best guess. Would be if there's like thousands of people playing this, the noise yeah. cancel out. Well, there's always, there's always statistics, uh, yes. But um, it's a good point. Um, it's not the strategy we're taking at this point. Um, going from zero, we, we think that for a reasonably economic uh, number, we'll be able to do a, quite a good job with classical distribution. So I, I think we'll, just as fast as 30, we'll end it here. Oh, okay. Thank you so much.